Happy Sabbath once again, everyone. And um, before we get into the Word of God this afternoon, I would like to invite you to have a word of prayer with me. As I said last night, I'll say it once again. It's my firm belief that every time the Word of God is open, that the Spirit of the Lord is at hand to open up our understanding, to lead and direct us into all truth. And so it is my tradition every time I stand before God's people to encourage you to, number one, please pray for yourself, that the Holy Spirit himself, he will be the one to give you instruction. And please pray for myself as well that I'll be nothing more than a vessel in the hand of God so that his name might be lifted up and that his truth might be made plain. So before we engage in the study of the word of God, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me if you're inclined to do so. And just take the next few moments to pray silently in your hearts to ask for the Lord to speak to you. If there's anything that is within your life that you need to set before the Lord to confess and forsake, take this time right now to do that. And then when you hear my voice, I'll be closing us in prayer. So let us ask for God and his spirit to come and make his abode within us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath rest, for the time that we've already had to consider what's going on and how you have called us as a people to lift up the banner of truth. Lord, as we continue to study your word, we ask that you would please open up the treasure house of wisdom that you bring forth things old and things new, and that your spirit would lead and direct us into all truth as you promised that he would do in John 16, 13. Lord, please cleanse my heart of all pride, self-trust, and self-righteousness so that I can be used by you as a conduit through which you might pour out your grace upon your people. The world is being deceived Please, send forth thy light and thy truth. This is our prayer. And we thank you for hearing and answering our petition, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The purpose for which we are all here, beyond the fact that this is God's holy Sabbath day, which is always the primary reason that we should gather together on this, the seventh day of the week. But the main purpose that many of us are gathered here right now from north, south, east, and west is because of the events that are getting ready to take place in just a few days from now. We know that men are getting ready to place their hands upon sacred history. And the world is being deceived about the true character of the Roman Catholic Church. But the Word of God has something to say about this system, and it cannot be ignored. And I believe that as we look at Bible prophecy concerning this system, in particular I'm talking about the papacy, it will not only be clear in our minds that this is not a power that we should just play around with, but it also become clear in our minds, I pray, that it is moving into its last phases before it once again gains the seat of global dominance. The Bible tells us we're going to the book of Revelation, chapter 17. I want to begin at the first verse. Once again, we're looking at Revelation, the 17th chapter, looking at the first verse. The Bible tells us there, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vows. And he talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, which sitteth upon many waters, and with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine 
of her fornication. Notice that there's an angel conversing with John the Revelator. And the Bible says that this angel is one of the seven angels that possesses the seven vials. Now, the word of God begins to give us more information about this angel and the other six that he's associated with in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. Revelation 16, beginning at verse 1. The Bible will begin to open up our understanding concerning this angel that's conversing with John. The Bible tells us there, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying unto the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the what? Wrath of God upon the earth. It's clear that these vials that the angels possess, they contain the wrath of God. Now, look at Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. Because we're going to look at the scriptures right now, line upon line, precept upon precept. And the Bible begins to amplify our understanding of these angels, those vials, and their contents. In Revelation 15 and verse 1, the Bible says, And there appeared another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. So these seven angels, they possess seven vials, and these seven vials contain the seven last plagues, and these seven last plagues are the wrath of God. And the Bible actually lets us know when the wrath of God will commence being poured out upon humanity. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 14, looking at verse 9. Revelation 14 and verse 9, we know it to be the third angel's message of the three angels that are spoken of in Revelation, the 14th chapter. And this angel, the Bible says, declares with a loud voice, if any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into his cup of indignation. So the wrath of God, which is the seven last plagues, they are poured out after every thinking man and woman will make their decision concerning the issue of the mark of the beast, which we know will be the legal implementation of a day of rest, which is contrary to the word of God. When every individual makes their decision on this issue, the wrath of God will commence, which is the pouring out of the seven last plagues. And one of these angels that possess one of those vials that contain one of those plagues, which is the wrath of God, is actually conversing with John, and he says to John, Come hither, I'm going to show unto you the judgment of the great whore which lets us know that here in Revelation chapter 17, this angel is getting ready to present to John evidence that incriminates the whore as being a worthy recipient of the wrath of God, the plagues. So we're supposed to be looking for evidence. This angel is going to show this is the reason why the whore should receive the wrath of God. This is the reason why the whore is worthy of the plagues. Here are the reasons why God is going to judge this system thus. Not only does the Bible call this system that will receive the judgment from God a whore, but it says that this whore commits fornication with the kings of the earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, for those of us that are not familiar with Bible prophecy, a woman in Bible prophecy is a symbol of a church. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, you can go there, but definitely make a note of it. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, the Bible says, I have likened the daughter of Zion unto a comely and delicate woman. In Isaiah 51 and verse 16, Concerning Zion, the Bible says, Say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Zion is the people of God. He likens his people unto a comely and delicate woman. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2 once again amplifies this prophetic truth that a woman in Bible prophecy is nothing more than a symbol of God, a church. But this woman in Revelation chapter 17, although she is a woman, the Bible says that she's a whore. She may be comely, she may be delicate, but she certainly isn't a virgin. The Bible says she's a whore. 
And the way that she's exercised her whoredom is by having fornication with the kings of the earth. So we're looking at a church that has broken its covenant relationship with its husband. And the only husband that God's church is supposed to have is Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 6. What is the covenant that God has established between himself and his woman, his church? It's right here in the Bible. I want you to open your scriptures with me to the book of Exodus chapter 34. We want to go there right now because the word of God makes this issue plain. Exodus chapter 34, we're looking at verse 28. What is the covenant between God and his people that this whore has broken, that this church has shown itself to be unfaithful to. The Bible tells us right here, Exodus chapter 34, looking at verse 28, concerning the events that surrounded the life of Moses, it says there, and he was with the Lord there 40 days and 40 nights, and he did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are God's covenant between him and and his church. It's like the vows between the bridegroom and his bride. This church has shown itself unfaithful to God's commandments. So we're looking at a religious system that has literally broken God's commandments. Furthermore, the Bible tells us that this church has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. We're looking at a Woman, we know that to be a church. That's an ecclesiastical power. But now, when you think of kings, are you thinking of church? Are you thinking of religion? Are you thinking of ecclesiastical? Does that that immediately jump into your mind when you hear the word king? No, you think of a civil power. Am I right? You think of a kingly power because it's a king. Well, what we're looking at, my friends, is a church fornicating with the state. Now, look what the Bible has to say concerning this. It's an interesting scripture, I believe. It's in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Open your Bibles there with me, please. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, I believe I'm turning you to the right chapter. I let you know earlier, I always say first, I might be saying second. But this is correct. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want you to see this looking at verse 16. It says this, what know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body for the two saith he shall be one flesh. So when someone commits fornication with a harlot, what happens? The two become what? One. So when the kings of the earth commit fornication with this whore, what happens? The two become one. So what we're looking at is a union of church and state. Brothers and sisters, just from the onset of Revelation chapter 17, the Bible begins to narrow down exactly what system we're looking at. We're looking at a church that has abrogated God's commandments. We're looking at a church that has entered into league with the political powers of our world. There is no other entity that is in existence or has ever been in existence that could truly meet up with these defining characteristics other than the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. And we are told that the inhabitants of our world have become corrupted through the influence that comes about as a result of this unholy union because Jesus Christ himself does not condone the union of church and state. You are all familiar with the instance in which the Pharisees came to try and trip up Jesus with their questioning. And they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He said, why do you tempt me? Give me a penny. Whose name and superscription is on this penny? He said, they said Caesar. He said, okay, well, render therefore to Caesar the things that be Caesar's and unto God the things that be God's. He established very firmly in that scripture that the separation of church and state should always be maintained. But this system, in its unfaithfulness to God, has sought allegiances with the world and therefore has broken its covenant with God. James chapter 4 and verse 4 has something else to say about that. Please turn your Bibles there. In James, the fourth chapter, looking at the fourth verse, this is what the Bible says about his people that refuse to maintain 
that separation from the world that God says must always exist. In James 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore shall be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. So we're talking about a church that has entered into league with the world and God says whenever his people enter into an intimate allegiance with the world, not only are they committing spiritual fornication, but they now set themselves up as enemies of the throne of God. So this system is anti-Christ. If you understand what I'm saying, just say amen. It is opposed to the rule of Jesus Christ. It does not, tr it does not seek the face of God to be the only one that maintains them, so to say. This power will look to temporal agencies, will look to kings and civil powers to carry out their exploits. And God says this power will receive judgment as a result of engaging in these sinful transactions. Let's move rapidly forward because there's something in particular that I would like us to get to, but if we don't go through the, pre the information that comes prior to it, then none of the rest will make sense. Go with me. We're looking at Revelation chapter 17, going to verse 3 now. Revelation chapter 17, going to verse 3, as the angel tells John that he's going to show unto him the judgment of this system, this religious system that has left God and has entered into league with the kings of the earth, therefore contracting an unholy union as this angel begins to unravel the information that incriminates the whore the bible says in verse 3 so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and i saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns now before we deal with the issue of the wilderness i want you to see that as this angel is speaking with John, he's showing him a mystery concerning a woman and a beast. Two entities, a woman and a beast. A woman is a symbol of a church in the Bible. A beast, according to Daniel chapter 7, you can make a note of this, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17. And Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, a beast in Bible prophecy always stands as a symbol of a kingdom, a political power, a civil power. The Bible says that as the angel transports John off in vision, he sees this woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. And he sees all of this in the wilderness. Why does the angel transport the... Are you with me right now? Why does the angel transport John in vision into the wilderness? And by the way, we need to take note of the fact that John is being transported in vision. And when one is being transported in vision, that means that the things that are revealed to them in that vision are not relegated to the time in which they physically exist. Does everybody understand what I just said? In other words, when in vision, one can see something that happened in the past, one can see something that's transpiring in the future, one can see something that is actually unfolding in the present hour in which they live, but time does not bind what is revealed in vision. John was taken off in vision into the wilderness. What does the wilderness have to do with this woman? I want you to go with me, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, we're going to begin at verse 4. Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 4, the Bible tells us something about the wilderness. We have to go to the Word of God to find these answers. Yes, the wilderness can denote being in obscurity. Yes, the wilderness can denote this, but look what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 12, we're going to verse 4. The Bible tells, verse 6 rather, forgive me. The Bible says this. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she have a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1,203 score days. I want you to look as well with me to verse 14, same chapter. It says, and to the woman were given two wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time 
times and dividing of time from the face of the serpent. Notice that in Revelation 12 and verse 6 and Revelation 12 and verse 14, we have some of the same elements. We have a woman, we see the wilderness, and we see a specific time frame associated to this time in which the woman flees into the wilderness. And in Revelation 12 and verse 6, that time frame is stated as 1,000 Two hundred and three score days. A score is twenty. If you have three scores, that's three times twenty. So what you really have is one thousand two hundred and sixty days. But those of you here that are Bible students, you know that in Bible prophecy, a day can be equal to a year. So if we take that information that is found within Numbers chapter fourteen and verse thirty-four and Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, and bring it right with us into Revelation chapter 12, we realize that it's not talking about 1,260 days, it's talking about 1,260 years. Same thing, looking at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14, the Bible says that the woman was in the wilderness for a time, times, and dividing of time. A time is equal to a year, composed of 360 days, as we're looking at it from a, from a biblical perspective. Times would be two years. Dividing of time, half a year. If you do the mathematics on that, once again, you come up with that same figure, 1,260 days. A day is equal to a year in Bible prophecy, so we're really looking at 1,260 years. And what is happening in Revelation chapter 12? For this time frame of this 1,260 years, we see a woman, which we already have come to understand is a symbol of God's church, fleeing in the wilderness. She is running, and in verse 14, rather, yes, verse 14 of Revelation chapter 12, she's fleeing from the face of the serpent. So she's being pursued. Now, this woman is not the only agency that the Bible speaks of as occupying this 1,260-year time frame. Look with me at Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation, the 13th chapter, the Bible makes something very clear that helps us understand why the angel took John off in vision into the wilderness. Look at verse 4. The Bible tells us here, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verse 5, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So here's this power, a beast, and we've already come to find out that a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol of a kingdom. But this is no normal civil power. How do we know that? Because in verse 5 of Revelation 13, we are told that this beast has a mouth that speaks great things and blasphemies. Now, blasphemy, according to Mark chapter 2 and verse 7, Mark chapter 2 and verse 7, blasphemy is the act of a man professing that he has the ability to forgive another man of his sins. Are you with me right now? In John chapter 10 and verse 33, Blasphemy is defined as a man taking upon himself the prerogatives of God. We're looking at a civil power that blasphemes. So this is a civil entity that stepped outside of the realms of stately power. It also has taken upon itself the mantle of ecclesiastical authority. And not only that, it seeks to literally set itself up in the place of God. How do we know that? Because it speaks blasphemies. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So this is a, this may be a political power, but it certainly has ecclesiastical agendas. We're looking at a system that unites church and state. And it is given the power and the authority to exercise this rule over the inhabitants of planet Earth for a time frame. What's that time frame? Verse 5 of Revelation chapter, 3, Revelation chapter 13 tells us that that time frame is, one, is for 42 months. 42 months. Now, if you have 30 days to a month, 
and you multiply 30 times 40, what does that give you? 1,260 days. But remember, a day is equal to a year in Bible prophecy according to Numbers 14, verse 34, Ezekiel 4, and verse 6. So we're really looking at 1,260 years that this power that unites church and state and literally receives its authority directly from the devil, it rules over the world. And how does it exercise its authority? Forward with me, go forward with me. Revelation chapter 13, I want you to look with me at verse 7. It says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to do what? And to overcome them. The saints is just another biblical term that is used to identify God's people, his church. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why John was carried off in vision into the wilderness. Because the angel was literally taking John to the murder scene where God's saints, his people, his woman was being pursued by this system, the papacy, for 1,260 years. From 538 A.D. all the way through 1798 A.D., the papacy hunted down God's commandment-keeping people. It was in this very same time frame that we saw many people standing up for the faith which we now hold dear. They gave their lives for it. Jesus says, he that toucheth you touches the apple of mine eye. Jesus said, as much as they have done unto the least of these, they've done it unto me. The angel takes John to the time frame where Jesus, in the person of his saints, was being slain for 1,260 years. What more incriminating evidence could be brought to the table as to why this system, the papacy, is worthy of the wrath of God? Notice, when you look in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3, I want you to open your Bibles back there with me because we're going to analyze a few things. Revelation 13, excuse me, Revelation 17 and verse 3. When you look back there, you'll notice that the Scripture tells us, and I saw a woman sit. This is an action verb. Am I correct? You know, if he said, I saw a woman sitting, that means he came into the room and he saw the woman already right there on top of the beast. But when, he, when the Bible says he saw a woman sit, that means he saw her go from the standing position to the sitting position. So he actually saw the transaction of the union of the church with the state. And in this union between church and state, who would be directing the course? The beast or the woman? It's obviously the one that's on top, huh? The woman. The Bible says concerning this system, I want you to walk with me, brothers and sisters, because this is a truth that is being swept under the carpet right now. This is something that most people do not want to identify as a fact, and this is the history that men are getting ready to try to rewrite, but the Bible keeps it on record to stand. God's people were slain by this system as long as this system continues to subvert the truth that is contained within the word of God and as long as this system continues to teach others to be unfaithful to God's commandments, it will be the antichrist system and it will not change. And there's no abridging of the story that will make that a reality. Revelation chapter 17, I want you to look with me at verse 4. Verse four the Bible says, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now we can go through all of these things and we can clearly see that number one, when you look at the attire that this woman is arrayed in, that it is very similar to the attire which the high priest was adorned in in the Old Testament sanctuary system. Once again, we can see how this power tries to subvert the ministry of Jesus Christ. Notice the word of God says that this woman has on many precious stones and she has on pearls. Not a pearl, but she has on pearls. If you remember, 
The parable that Jesus Christ presented to the listening multitude concerning the pearl of great price, how there was a merchant man that was searching for pearls, and then he found this one pearl of great price, and he sold all that he had so that he could obtain that pearl, and that pearl, my friends, was a symbol of salvation in the kingdom of God. The papacy says, no, there's not one pearl, there are many pearls. There are many ways of salvation. You know, it's so interesting. I have to bring these things up. I, you know, you have to make these things so real because it's true. It's not just theory. It's a fact. I was just in, I was just in Rome. And I was in, a, I was in, I forgot the name of this particular church, but it's by, the, it's by the Lateran Cathedral, by the same building where General Mussolini signed the Lateran Concordant with Cardinal Gaspari. And inside of that building, they have what they call the Holy Stairs. These stairs are supposed to be the stairs that were in Jerusalem that Jesus ascended to Pilate's judgment hall. So by some interesting means of human ingenuity, they transported this staircase from Jerusalem to Rome. Of course, of course. Pope Pius VII declared <laughs> that anyone that ascended these stairs in the recommended fashion would have nine years of sin removed from their record for every steer. The recommended, the recommended fashion was on your knees. So every steer you climb on, what, every steer you climb, that's nine years. 28 steers, boy, you can go on sinning for the rest of your lifetime. So if you're looking to, they're teaching there's many ways of salvation. You can get to the kingdom of heaven by climbing some stairs on your knees. Oh, the poor, the poor souls that I saw climbing those stairs on their knees and kissing them at every step, deceived, but devout in their service to God. And I believe that many of them are going to stand on this platform of truth in the very near future, but they need to know the truth. Many ways, they say, many pearls, many ways of salvation this system declares are available to humanity. But the, the Bible makes it very clear in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Word of God goes on to declare concerning this apostate system. Looking with me now at verse 5. Of Revelation chapter 17, the Bible says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Look at verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wandered with great admiration. I find this verse of Scripture particularly interesting. Because it says the woman is now drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Number one, to get drunk, you need more than one glass. This means that we're looking at a point in time when the Roman Catholic Church, led out by the papacy, led out by the Pope, has been engaged in persecuting and persecuting and persecuting and spilling the blood of God's people to such an extent that the blood is running freely. Matter of fact, in great controversy, forgive me, I can't remember the exact page, but please do be a Berean and check to see whether the things I'm sharing with you are so. In great controversy, this very but this very Bible scripture is directly connected to the events that transpired under the acts of the Inquisition. Blood. You know what else I find interesting about that scripture? Always messed with my mind for a little bit. It says, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the martyrs of Jesus. Wouldn't you think to yourself that the martyrs of Jesus are the same as the saints? And wouldn't you think to yourself that the saints are the same as the martyrs of Jesus? Doesn't that make sense, what I'm saying right now? But evidently, they're different because the Bible says they're drunken with the blood of the saints and with the martyrs of Jesus. Well, who are these martyrs? I want you to look with me in the book of Revelation chapter 2. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. We're going to go to verse 13. 
And I bring this verse of scripture out to your attention in particular because of the hour that we're right now standing in and the events that we're looking for to take place in just hours from now. Revelation chapter 2, looking at verse 13, speaking of the church of Pergamos, the Bible says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith even in those days were in Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. You can look throughout the entire testimony of the Bible, all 66 books. You will never find one other scripture that references this character, Antipas. You can even look in sacred history you will not find much from any historian on Antipas. It's as if he never existed, and yet Jesus, and I do say Jesus because this is red lettering, this is Jesus speaking right here in Revelation chapter 2, and yet Jesus says that Antipas was his faithful martyr in this time in which the papacy was beginning its iron reign upon the face of planet Earth. So there must be something, in my estimation, symbolic about that name Antipas. You know, if you take that name, you break it down, and you look at anti. Anti means against. Pas comes from the root word papa. Papa is the word that they use to speak about a man by the name of the Pope. Do you know of any individuals that were anti-Pope in those hours? That gave their lives for the truth? That had their blood shed? because they had a message in particular that they were declaring that the Pope of Rome indeed is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. I want you to consider this. One of the things that are most impressive upon my mind when I look at Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5, verse 6, the Bible says that when John a man that is filled with the Spirit of God. How filled with the Spirit of God is he? He's in vision right now. He's not just filled with the Spirit of God. He's directly under the influence of the Spirit of God at the time that he's revealing to us these things. The Bible says when he saw this scene of this system, this church that had gained control of the state, and was able to use civil power to cause the world to bow to its dictates, and those who would not bow to lose their lives, the Bible says that John wondered with great admiration. Have you ever considered that? Man, filled with the Spirit of God, he's in vision, and yet when he sees this system, he begins to admire it, and he doesn't just admire it, he wonders with great admiration. The scene is so deceptive. Look at verse 7. The angel says to John, Wherefore didst thou marvel? Why are you wandering at this system like it's a great thing? It's as if, you know, I'm more... Let me be a little bit American right now. It's as if the angel said, Wake up, John! This is not something good that you're looking at. I'm going to show unto you the mystery of this woman. Brothers and sisters, I believe that God left this on record for a reason. Because when that power, the Roman Catholic Church, was ruling at the summit of its authority, this man of God, filled with the Spirit of God, wandered with great admiration. What do you think is getting ready to happen in the near future? Why do you think the world is going to wander after the beast? The Bible tells us, matter of fact, in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, you know this scripture very well. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Matthew, chapter 24, and verse 24, the Bible tells us, For there shall rise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. The deception is going to be so great that we are going to have to be kept from the deception the very same means, the very same way that John was kept from the deception. By divine 
Are you listening to me? By divine intervention. That's why the word of God warns us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. It says, And grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It is the Holy Spirit, the only person of the Godhead that has been given unto humanity to lead and direct us into all truth. And not only to lead and direct us into all truth, but to keep us sealed up in that truth so that when the four winds are let loose and deception is gripping humanity and all the voices of the world are saying, this must be the great power of God, this must be a time of revival, this must be the great millennium right before us, the Spirit of God is going to say to us, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Did you understand how important it is that right now we understand the voice? We, we know the voice of the Spirit of God. That when the Spirit speaks to us, we know that it is Him. That the Spirit doesn't have to work in great signs and great wonders, but we know the voice of God intimately, personally for ourselves. It's just like Elijah when he was in the mount. The Lord said, I'm going to come and meet with you, Elijah. First there was an earthquake. God wasn't in it. There was fire. God wasn't in it. But when Elijah heard the still, small voice, he covered his face with the mantle and went out because he knew the voice of God. We must know the voice of God. And that comes from a daily, intimate relationship with the Lord that starts by your bed when you wake up in the morning. With consecrating your heart to the service of the Lord with asking him for that same spirit that not only fortified his saints of old to study, to memorize, to know and obey the truth, but to declare it even though their lives might be lost as a result of doing so. We have to have that relationship. I must have it. You must have it. All that will be redeemed will have it. The Bible says that the angel said to John, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore which sitteth upon many waters. I'm going to show unto you this, the truth, the mystery of this system. Look with me. I want you to go with me. Revelation chapter 17, looking at verse 7. The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The Bible tells us in verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was, it was in power. That civil power, it was reigning. 538 to 1798. It was and is not. Deadly wound was inflicted. That power was lost. 1798. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That is an event that we are looking forward to in the very near future. And the word of God tells us that when this system once again rises up and seizes the seat of dominance, not only will God bring it to the sides of hell, it will go into perdition, but when it takes this seat of authority once again, those that dwell upon the earth, the Bible says, will wonder. They will wander after this beast whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, that book of life is spoken of as the book of the Lamb. The book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, which lets me know only those that keep their eyes fixed on the Lamb will have their names fixed in the book. Because those that gain victory by faith in Jesus will have their names retained in the book. It says, when this power ascends out of the pit, all will wonder whose names are not written in the book of life. When they behold the beast that was and is not currently, but at that time, it is. In our final verse, verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. You know, there's a similar type of verbiage, language 
that is used in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 17, or rather verse 18, when it talks about the papal power, where it says, And here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, and his number is three, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Here in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 9, it says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Evidently, God wants us to think about this. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, those of us that are familiar with geography, the first thing we point to, and it should be pointed to, is the fact that Rome sits upon seven hills. It's a fact. It cannot be contradicted. Neither do we need to do that. Neither do we want to do that. But I always love to ask this question. Who is the author, the author of geography? The answer comes back, God. For he created all things. Which, makes, which brings me to my second question. Do you think that God knows the difference between a hill and a mountain? I mean, if he wanted to say seven hills, he could have said seven hills. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this prophecy is not pointing to Rome as the city upon seven hills. It's definitely an identifying characteristic. We need to take that fully into consideration, and it helps illustrate the fact concerning this system without a shadow of a doubt. But brothers and sisters, God knows the difference between a hill and a mountain. I know the difference between a hill and a mountain. It's a big difference. And in the Bible, a mountain holds its own prophetic symbolism. We saw that yesterday evening as we were studying the Word of God in the book of Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 when we saw the stone turning into a great mountain filling the whole earth, we found out that that mountain was a symbol of a kingdom. But now, go with me. I want you to go with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John the 6th chapter. You're all familiar with John chapter, excuse me, John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, you might recall that Jesus was interacting with the Samaritan woman at the well. Do you recall that? And as he was interacting with this woman, at one point he told her to go get her husband. And she said, sir, I have no husband. He said, you have said, well, because the man that you're with right now isn't your husband. Neither were the five previous men that you are with. Which led her to say, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And look what she says. We're looking at John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, beginning at verse 20, look at this woman's words. She said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. What was connected with the mountain here in John chapter 4? Worship. Notice she said that we as Samaritans believe that this is the right place to worship. And by the way, in Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 3, as we learned last night, God called Jerusalem his holy mountain. So she said, we think it's this mountain. You Jews are saying it's this mountain. Which mountain is it? In more contemporary language, it's almost like she said, well, my great-great-grandmother, my grandfather, and my mother and father said that this is the right denomination, but you Jews are saying this is the right denomination. Which worship system is the right one? Don't you see that right there? The mountain is directly connected to worship. Now, brothers and sisters, why is this relevant to Revelation chapter 17? Because we have not one, not two, not three, not four, but we have seven mountains. Seven in the Bible is a number of perfection. Could it not be that this beast that this woman is sitting upon, it's not wholly a civil entity, but it's also a system that has brought together in some type of unholy harmonious union, all the systems of faith. Is that possible? Brothers and sisters, we know that this beast has entered into this type of transaction. How do we know this? Because Revelation 17 and verse 3, speaking not of the woman, but of the beast that she rides upon, it says, upon its heads is the name of blasphemy. That means that this political entity has entered into ecclesiastical realms. 
Brothers and sisters, what am I trying to say? In the final analysis of everything, the Roman Catholic Church is going to be placed in a system, in a situation rather, where it will hold the reins over both church and state on a global scale. It's coming. And what is getting ready to take place on the 31st of this month is one huge leap in the direction of the fulfillment of this prophecy. What is taking place right now in Stockholm, Sweden, where these fallen apostate churches, which are the daughters of Mother Babylon, they're all coming together saying, we need to unite, we need to get along, and they're all working to cement this unholy union that is going to place the reins of authority in the hands of the papacy. And why is everybody going to give the reins into the hands of the papacy? I want you to look at something that the Bible said about this woman that we didn't look at earlier. Just go with me as we're coming to a close now. Revelation chapter 17. Look with me at verse 4. Revelation 17, looking at verse 4. In Revelation 17 and verse 4, the Bible says, And the woman was arrayed in what colors? Purple and scarlet. Why is that significant? I told you earlier that these are similar colors that are worn by the high priest in the Old Testament sanctuary system. But I want you to see what else the Bible says about a woman that wears purple. Go with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 31. In Proverbs chapter 31, beginning at verse 10. The Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. What type of woman? A virtuous woman. Look at the word of God says concerning her clothing. Verse 22 of the same chapter. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. The virtuous woman is the woman that wears purple. You know, brothers and sisters, the word virtuous means one of high moral fabric. Let me ask you a question. Is the world looking at the current Pope as the leading moral figure on the face of planet Earth? The answer is yes. Former president of Israel, Shimon Perez, met up with Pope Francis not too long ago. It's about a year or so ago now, about a year. Sat down with Pope Francis and said to Pope Francis that he needed to establish a world organization of religions to be a parallel organization to the United Nations because religion needs to play a role in the current affairs of our world because now the, war the wars that are being carried out in our world, they're not being carried out upon the basis of people trying to protect or extend the sovereignty of their control, but rather they're being carried out in the name of someone's faith. So he said, you know, you need to st establish a world organization of religions. You're the only one that can do it. You're the leading moral figure. Vice President of the United States of America, devout Roman Catholic Joe Biden, called Pope Francis the moral rudder of the world. And we can go on and on and on with, the, with key figures in our world that are looking to this current Jesuit Pope to be the compass of morality for humanity. The stage is set for the pages of Holy Writ to be the reality that we walk in, that we're living in, and that all of us must face with Jesus or without him. Now, do you want to face what's getting ready to happen without Jesus? I tell you something, if John was without Jesus, he would have continued wandering after the beast. And we're, if we're without Jesus, we will indeed wander after the beast. But as was stated last night, and I'll state it once again, 
In the very same chapter of Revelation, chapter 17, we see a war ensues between this beast and the lamb, but the Bible makes it clear that the lamb will overcome because he is Lord of lords. He is king of kings. And he will have a people that are with him that the word of God declares are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. We must be in those ranks, all of us. Because the lamb laid down his life to ensure your salvation. And all of these prophecies are brought clearly to our attention so that we are not deceived by the lies that are getting ready to permeate our world, but rather that we might be bright shining lights on a hill continuing to point the people that will hear in the right direction. The world needs to know that God's truth hasn't changed. His law has never been abrogated. And that he sits at the right hand of the throne interceding for them that they might be saved. The world needs to know the truth. But first, we must be transformed by it. And so it's my prayer that we will not grieve the Spirit of God. As the Word of God says, as I close with this scripture, and I think it's so fitting, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 35, the Bible says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience. In the end, God will have a people that can, he can say, These are my patient ones. Ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by what's in the news. The just shall live by faith. Brothers and sisters, if we were just to look at everything the news had to say about the Pope, we could never believe what the Word of God has to say. Because he kisses babies, he kisses feet, he kisses anything that he can put his lips on. He seems like a holy man. The Bible said, the just shall live by faith. The word of God. He said, if any man turns back, my soul shall have no delight in him. But I love the final words of Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. May we have a faith that gains us an abundant entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that your word is clear. There is more that could be said, but enough has been said. Many of these things we've heard rehearsed in our ears over and over and over again. But once again, your word said, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you already know them, and be established in the present truth. As Jesus was making his way to the cross, his message changed, and he began to warn the disciples about the coming crisis. And I believe that we have come to this same situation. We must be alert. And now, more than ever, our mouths must become the trumpets to warn the world of the coming crisis. Please, use us for your honor. And Lord, save us in your kingdom, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.